Good morning, church. Today's reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 1 to 13. Let's read chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 1 to 13, sorry. Okay, let's read. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of, of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God. A very good morning from my side. I uh, hope you have had a good morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Luan, uh, and it's my privilege to open up God's Word as we look at the Lord's Prayer together. And so I want to pray for us and ask God and His Spirit to be with us. And so I want you to bow as we pray together. Father, we, uh, we come to you humbly, not in our own strength. We ask that you would work by your Spirit and your Word uh, to convict us and challenge us through your prayer. Would we be changed? Uh, would, we, 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 would we be people who are different and uh, shaped by your word uh, as we leave this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when I was at primary school, uh, which is not too long ago uh, now, uh, we used to say the Lord's Prayer every morning. Uh, you could wake me up in the middle of the night and I would be able to recite it word for word every time. Maybe that's been your experience. But I had no idea what I was praying. I just kind of knew the words. It was just this religious activity that we did before we started our day at school. This may be your experience. This may still be your experience, as, you say, as we said the Lord's Prayer this morning. But what I want to do is show you the beauty of this prayer. It's more than just saying that we can pray mindlessly. I think if we've truly understood it, if you've truly prayed it, it reveals that something truly profound has happened to you. In a way, this prayer functions as a litmus test to real relationship with God. So I want to unpack it this morning and challenge us, and may it shape us this morning. If you haven't been with us in the Gospel of Luke, we've been working our way through it in big chunks, trying to, to grasp what Luke is trying to tell us. And we find ourselves in a section in Luke's Gospel where we've seen that Jesus has been proclaimed as the Christ, the Messiah, the one who's come to rescue his people. And as he 
he is proclaimed as Christ, we see that he is the Christ who's come to die on a cross. And he's the king who's come humbly to and go to Jerusalem and, and suffer and die. In three days, he says, he will rise again. And on the way, he, as he journeys to Jerusalem, and he's teaching his disciples, and he's teaching us as we read it, what it means to follow him, what it means to be a true disciple, and why it is so important that we really do follow him. This morning, as he engages with his disciples, as he is confronted with a number of different people along the journey, he's asking us all again this morning, do you truly understand what it means to follow me and be a part of my kingdom? Do you really understand it? And so I want to show you from the Lord's Prayer what real relationship with God looks like and contrast that with those who have misunderstood Jesus and his kingdom and what he brings. If you've been with us in Luke, you would have noticed that Jesus is a man of prayer. Jesus lived and taught a life of prayer. And again, we find him here in chapter 11, verse 1, praying. Have a look there. One day, and Jesus was praying in a certain place. Jesus shows us already here in verse 1 what it means to be in relationship with God. We've seen in Luke, like I said, we've seen at every key moment in his life and his ministry, he has sought the strength and the, the guidance from his Father through prayer, unlike the disciples. So before even looking at the prayer itself, we see that real relationship with God is seen in us praying. We are people who pray. And Jesus demonstrates this to us. Uh, prayer is our greatest struggle and our greatest joy if you've ever tried to pray. And prayer is a privilege of the gospel. And through Jesus, we can now approach God with boldness as his children, and bringing our request to him. Prayer is really a sign of a lived relationship with God. I always tell my daughter, you can pray any time, any place, any prayer. That's our privilege in the gospel. Prayer is, the way, is where we get to speak back to God in response to his word to us. The great reformer Martin Luther is known for his dedication to praying. He famously once commented, he says, I have so much to do today, I shall spend the first three hours praying. If I get a good three hours in a week, I'm, I'm happy. See, prayer is the greatest act of our day. We must fight for it. It's a key marker in our relationship with God. It's a marker, in fact, of, of, a, of a healthy church. You know, we, have, we have a full 10 a.m. service. But how, how, how well is our prayer meetings attended? See, prayer is a mark of relationship and a, a key mark of the health of of our church. See, if we are not fighting and wrestling with our sinful hearts and to pray, we need to check our hearts. In an article, Nick Avonkamp said this, he says, the problem of prayerlessness is not simply our smartphones or our schedules, but with our hearts. Our prayer lives reveal to us if we've really understood what it means to be in a relationship with God. Secondly, we see from the Lord's Prayer that real relationship with God is seen in us praying to God as Father. We've already seen that. Adam has already shown us that through in different ways this morning. But not only can we pray, but we can pray to Him as Father. We can call Him Father. Have a look at the opening line of the prayer. He says to them, when you pray, say Father. I don't know if the, prayer, the Lord's Prayer has become so familiar to you, just like it was when I recited it at school, that you miss the, the power and the privilege that we have to call God Father. It's, it's one of the most profound opening lines of prayer that we can understand. The one who is transcendent, the Holy One, we get to call Him Father. It's language of intimacy. Lily, my daughter, calls me Dada. Uh, you might have heard her running when she sees me in the morning, Dada. And not everybody has that freedom and intimacy to call me that, thank goodness. That would be awkward. Um, Alan's done it once or twice. Um, yeah. 
And not everyone is able to, in the middle of the night, call out to me and know that I will be there for her. Calling God Father is no small thing. It speaks of intimacy. If we know God as Father, Jesus has revealed this to us. Remember last week, as Jesus rejoices in the Holy Spirit, in, in the way God works for salvation, he says these words. Have a look at chapter 10, verse 21 to 22. It should be on the screen if you want to follow along. It says, At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you please to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. If you can call God Father, if you know Him as Father, Jesus has revealed that to you by His grace. Knowing and calling God Father is an indication of real, lived faith. You see, Lily didn't always call me Dada, but both for my wife and I, one of our greatest joys was the day we went to court and we got to, to sign the final adoption papers, which said, as if born unto you, that's how much he belongs to you. At that point, Lily received all the benefits of being my daughter, being able to call out to me in the evenings, be able to have an intimate relationship with me. You see, the great joy as Christians is that we have been adopted into God's family through faith in His Son. And by the power of His Spirit, we can call God Father. Isn't that amazing? The same Father that we have rebelled against and sinned against, we can now call Him Father. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Because you are His sons... God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. And what does the Spirit allow us to do? The Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Romans chapter 8, Paul says the same thing. He says, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies to our spirits that we are God's children. Calling God Father means you have been given God's Spirit. And we see that in the passage that was read. The Spirit is, is gifted to us by God. Have a look there again in Luke chapter 11, verse 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if you ask for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Calling God Father and believing in Jesus is the, um, Jesus is the, means, is the means by which God gives you his Spirit. It is the language of salvation in this passage. The pouring out of God's Spirit. Things that the Old, the Old Testament prophets long to see. Where God will freely give His Spirit. Not only to prophets and kings, but to everybody who would believe in Him. And Jesus says the opposite is also true. Rejecting Jesus and His work is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Have a look at chapter 12, verse 8 to 12. It says, I tell you. Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will also be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. See, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is having a persistent hardness of heart in opposition to Jesus who is the means of our salvation. A failure to see Jesus as he truly is and rejecting him is rejecting the work of the Spirit and therefore is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. There is no forgiveness for that because that is, where, that is the only place where we can find forgiveness. 
But can I say that this passage speaks of, of God the Father being gracious to us? God invites you again this morning to call him Father through faith in Jesus and by the power of his Spirit. Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, and the Father will graciously give you his Spirit, which unites you to Christ and his work of salvation. God will save you. No matter your background, no matter how much you have sinned against him, if you call out to him, and believe in his, in his Son, He will give, graciously give you His Spirit. That's the type of Father He is. He's a loving Father. And we see this in the many parables that Jesus gives in verses 5 to 13. And Jesus loved parables. And he, loves to use, he loved to use parables as a contrast. And we see Him doing this here. See, God is not like the irritated friend that you wake up in the middle of the night. He's the most caring Father imaginable. How much more in verse 13 means that God is much more inclined to hear us and to help us as we, when we pray to him than any earthly father has ever been? How much more will God be like this? As a good father, he knows what, what we need. He knows what it means to give good gifts to his children. See, there is security in the father's love when we come to him in prayer. And just like going to that neighbor persistently, God says that you can come to him persistently at any time in the day, any time, and he will graciously hear you, not out, of, not out of obligation like the friend did in the parable, but out of a love for you, out of a relationship that you have with the Father. See, this is what it means to know God as Father. He is not a distant God, but one that is personal, one that wants to know you, one that wants to hear from you. One that wants to seek fellowship with you. He calls you this morning to real relationship with the Father, to not hold him at a distance. What a great privilege it is that we can call him Father through adoption in Christ. Don't let that just pass you by. That's, that's the privilege we have. Thirdly, real relationship is seen in what we prioritize. Our prayers are God-centered prayers. Have a look again at verse 2. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Our priorities, our hearts are laid bare when before anything else, before the long list of things that we want God to do for us, which is often what we, what we pray about, our priorities are seen when we pray that God's name be glorified above all things, and that God's kingdom advance in our world. And that that would be the first thing we pray. Real relationship with God means that we have, we have a kingdom focus. And we see this in the Lord's Prayer, the priority of his, of his name. Holy be your name, hallowed be your name. This, this is a prayer saying, may your name, Lord, may your person and who you are and everything you stand for be honored and lifted above everything else in this world, including myself. Your name be honored. It is a prayer that God calls on God to cause all people, including ourselves, to revere him, to lift up his name. He says, your kingdom come. This is a prayer asking God, God, would you cause your kingly reign and rule to influence our world and our hearts? Would that be true of us in our world? It is, a, it is a desire to see God's kingdom come in its fullness, the finally come and abolish evil for good and establish righteousness forever. He, that's, that's the type of prayer he's asking us to pray. If we are kingdom people, these are the things we long for our world and ourselves. You see, we cannot pretend to be people of the kingdom. We cannot pretend like me reciting this, the, the Lord's Prayer and thinking that I'm a believer. This was the case for some of the religious leaders that Jesus is, is confronted with here in this section in Luke. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and the experts in the law in, verse, in chapters 11 for pretending to be people who honor his name and, and, and lift up his kingdom. Because in reality, they were just religious hypocrites. 
Have a look there with me as he engages with the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law in chapter 11 from verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But, but now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful gatherings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. The Pharisees loved to look godly. They loved to look like they honored God's name and were thinking about his kingdom. They were people who looked educated and clean and alive, but really they were rotting on the inside. They loved to be legalistic. They loved to give mints and ruse and, and tie their herbs, but neglected the justice. They neglected to love God. They looked godly. They had developed ways of appearing to be godly without prioritizing God and his kingdom in their hearts. They enjoyed the best seats in the house. They enjoyed to be honored at parties. They probably would have prayed, hallowed be my name, as they take their seats. See, there is a huge difference between being, being in right, right relation with God or being religious. Maybe God is exposing your own heart this morning as you prayed the Lord's Prayer, just like you've done a thousand times. See, beware if there is a difference between what you say you believe and the reality of how you live that out. You see, if your priority is not God's name and his kingdom, but you like people to think it is, and Jesus says, beware of living like this. Beware of living like this because it will all be exposed. You see, you can, you can fool me. You can fool other people. But you can't fool God. Listen to chapter 12, verse 1 and 3. He says, mean, Meanwhile, when the crowds of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ears in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the, roof, from the roofs. I remember hearing a story of a, from a pastor of a, a couple who uh, he had suspected they were living to, sleeping together before marriage. And so he called them into his office and he said, um, someone, had come, someone knows what you've been doing behind closed doors. And they were very apprehensive about this conversation. And they asked the pastor, who, who knows about uh, us sleeping together? And at that point, he said, the Lord knows. And with great relief, they, thank goodness, I thought someone from the congregation uh, knew about it. You see, they were more concerned about how, how they were seen by people than what God, how God sees them. And Jesus exposes the hearts of the Pharisees. And rather than seeing their great need for him, they wanted to kill him. Which brings me to the final marker. Real followers of Jesus understand our great need for him. It's the last part of the Lord's Prayer. Real relationship is seen in understanding our need for God in everything. Not just in some things, but in everything. Have a look at verses 3 to 4 of chapter 11. It says, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. We also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. You see, we've prayed high, lofty prayers, haven't we? Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Lord. But God is not unconcerned about our daily needs. He's a good Father who knows what we need. 
So he calls us to pray that God would give us what we need. And this prayer is a recognition that God is our provider. Everything that we have has been given to us by our Father. It is a prayer that shows our deep dependency on Him for our daily needs. He says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. This is a recognition that we realize the problem is not other people and the problem is not outside ourselves, like the Pharisees thought, but the problem is within us. The problem is our sinful hearts that need forgiveness. And realizing that it is only God through His Son that can forgive us. It is coming to Him with our brokenness and our need for forgiveness. It's not a self-righteousness. It's a deep trust in the Son's sacrifice for our sins. It's understanding by God's grace, the great sign of Jonah. Have a look at chapter 11 and verse 29. Have a look there with me. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will give it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with people of this generation condemn it. For she came to the end, from the ends of the earth to listen to the Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the, prophes- at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus says to this generation that was seeking signs, that he will not give them a sign that they are looking for and asking for, but they will, he will give them a sign of Jonah. And the sign of Jonah is this. It points to the gospel of forgiveness. It points to the heart of the gospel. Jesus being cast into and being vomited out of death, just like Jonah was. For evil, rebellious people like us, that we might hear his words and repent and be saved just like the Ninevites did. That's the great sign of Jonah that Jesus says. Someone greater than Jonah is here. One with greater wisdom. See, it's not the sign the people were looking for, but it's the sign the people needed. It's the sign that we need. Jesus, like Jonah, is also a warning of God's coming judgment. Just like Jonah was a warning to the Ninevites. Jesus is the means by which we escape this judgment. Lord, forgive us our sins. We see our need for him. We also see our need at the end of this Lord's Prayer for Jesus to overcome evil. At verse 12, and lead us not into temptation. And in the other Gospels, Jesus elaborates, deliver us from the evil one. And you see what happens at, at just after the Lord's Prayer and just after the section? And Jesus is casting out demons. See, this prayer is asking God to help us not to be entangled with sin and to deliver us from all evil and all the schemes of the devil. We see Jesus meeting this need. Have a look at chapter 11, verse 14 to 23. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. It's interestingly that, uh, that Luke wants us to pay attention to that. After calling people that we can pray out to God, we can call him Father, we can proclaim his kingdom. This person is mute. This is what, the, this is what Satan wants from us. But Jesus drives him out. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking him for a sign from heaven. More signs, Jesus. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided among itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then you will know the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. 
But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he, will take, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus has come to crush the devil. He is the great serpent crusher we've been longing for since Genesis chapter 3. Jesus will end up sacrificing his life to crush the snake's head. And that is, where he's, that is where he's heading. That is why he's going to Jerusalem. Those who belong to him will understand their great need for him to overcome the evil one. And those who reject him, Jesus says, will reject the victory that Jesus offers. See, Jesus has challenged us all this morning through this prayer. Real relationship has been lit up and put on display. Are we people who pray? Are we people who can really call God Father? And we, are we people who prioritize His kingdom over all things? Do we see our, our need for Him in everything? Jesus says, and I'll end with these words, chapter 11, verse 28, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Let me pray for us. Father, these are great words. This prayer is beautiful. But Lord, so often we've prayed it not knowing what we've prayed. And I pray that we might know this prayer for the first time maybe as, as a true reflection of our relationship with you. Would you forgive us when we haven't prioritized your kingdom, when we haven't sought everything from you, when we've tried to be self-dependent? Please forgive us of that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I just have one announcement before we sing. Um, I don't know if you were here before, but before COVID, we had this thing called Connect Dinners. Uh, it's a great way of building relationship with our community here at church. Um, so it'll be happening over two weekends. You see the dates there uh, in October and November. Um, you can either sign up as a host, and so you can sign up as a dinner party host. You can do a dinner party, a tea party. Maybe you like brying and you want to do that. It doesn't need to be master chef quality. It's just about relationships. That's what we're all about. Or you can sign up to be someone who attends one of these events. Um, and later on, we will later this week, we'll send out those forms to either sign up as a host or to sign up as uh, those who want to attend. And I want to challenge the young adults. I know you want to sign up as someone who attends. I know, right? But maybe you want to host someone. That would be cool, right? Eh? Okay. Well, let's uh, let's close our service together by singing. Uh, let's sing together.